Pee Pee, which is my nickname. Um, a lot of people know me as that. My mom, right there, she actually gave me that for when I was born because all my hair was sticking straight forward like a unicorn. So she's like, well, you don't need to. So that's what she nicknamed me. So I came from Jackson today. Has anybody ever been to Jackson down there in Michigan? Yep, a couple people, so you know where that is. So I'm the lead pastor there of a church called Ravenbrook Recovery Church. So what you guys don't know, what she didn't say, because she probably doesn't know is that I'm actually a person in long-term recovery. So I've been clean and delivered and, and for 11 years now. Right. And, and my mom, she's also been clean and delivered for, for six years, and my dad. And, and so God reached out to me a while back. I was an um, associate pastor of a church in Jackson, and he's like, recovery church. And I was like, mm, I don't think I want to start a church, especially not a recovery church. That doesn't seem like it's going to be too well received. And, um, and I didn't think that I was equipped for the right person for it. And then he reminded me of my journey and, and where he's where he's led me. So I'm like I mentioned, I'm a person in long-term recovery. So what that looks like for me is that I have I'm in recovery for pills, for alcohol, for pornography, for anger, for I'm recovering from childhood sexual trauma, and a host of other things that God is constantly healing. that you guys were working on a summer of songs. Does that sound familiar? She's been working yep. through the songs? Yeah. Some of y'all sleep, you're like, songs, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I look forward to actually kind of sticking with that trend today. Uh, but I'm going to put a recovery spin on it because that's my heart, that's my passion. And so I, what I like to do is I'm a person who's worked the 12 steps. And so I work the 12 steps all the time. And even in my, the way that the church is set up, it's a 12-step program, but the focus, the, the higher power is specifically Jesus. So I'm going to bring a little bit of that to you today. Now, here's the thing. I know some of y'all are like, you need, I don't need recovery. What are you talking about? I don't need recovery. I don't have an alcohol problem. I don't have a drug problem. I don't need recovery. But here's the real deal. Everyone in here is in need of recovery from something. It may not be drugs or alcohol, or it might. It may be overeating. It may be bitterness. It may be anger. It may be workaholics. It may be unforgiveness. It may be gossip. It may be sexual appetites. Whatever it is, there's always something that God looks, looks deep inside and is like, I want to heal them. I want to work through them. I want to deliver them. I want to move through them. I want to teach them. I want them to grow in these areas. So that's the position that I'm coming from. So we're going to skip the first three steps. And we're going to jump right into step four. Is anybody familiar with any of the 12 steps at all? Have you heard that phrase? A yep. couple people? Okay. So step four is where we call the, 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 the meat and the potatoes. Come on in, y'all. I'm muting. Uh, so the step four is the meat and potatoes. It's where we, where we say, when you get to step four, you've already confessed that basically Jesus is your higher power, that you need his help in order, and that your life is kind of like falling apart, and you need him. And so you need him in, in these specific areas to bring recovery, to bring healing. So then when you get to step four, that's why I call the meat and potatoes, because step four says we are making, a, making and searching a fearless moral inventory of ourselves. So I'm going to repeat that again. Step four, we are making a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. So with that step comes a principle called accountability. Now it is. It's, it's the hardest step. It's like step four. You're right. Step four is that heart step. It's like a lot of people, when they get to step four, they cry. They fold under the pressure of it. And so step four is where, lack of a better term, where the magic happens. So with this comes the accountability piece. And accountability is defined as an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's actions. So there you have it. That's basically what step, step four is in a nutshell. It's about accountability. So sticking with Pastor Sheila's um, theme of the Summer of Psalms, there's going to be two scriptures that I focus on today. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Psalms 139, and it's verses 23 through 24. Tell me, say amen when you get it. And then there's a second one. So I want you to bookmark that one. And that one's going to be Psalm 32.5. Psalms 139, 
verses 23 through 24. And the second one is going to be Psalms 32, verse 5.
for us to be, for us to invite him in. And then he will graciously take that seat because he loves us and he wants to be gentle with our hearts in the process of it. A lot of times people present him as this, you know, over with this rod, like, wow, I'm going around smacking people when in reality, his heart is crying out, like, I just want to change you. Yes. But I want you to yes. want me to change you. Right. I'm not so going good. to make you change. Amen. I want yes. you to want me to change you. Yes. Because of his love and gentleness for us. So let's start with Psalms 30, 39, 23 through, 30, through 24. That's where I'm going to focus on for a little bit. So I'm going to reread that. <coughs> Psalms 139, 23 through 24. Here's what he says. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. Now, one of the things that I found really interesting about this prayer is the context when it's found. So right, the verse is right before it. David is basically saying to God, like, you know what, God, it would be good if you just, like, kill all the wicked people, the murderers, the people who take lives without blinking an eye. David's, like, saying all this stuff to God. He's like, basically, I can't stand it when people take your name in vain. Like, it gets under my skin when God, when they talk about you and say it, but then they, they say stuff and then they act like they serve you, but then they do all this other wicked stuff. But they pretend to serve you. Lord, you know what, just count them as my enemies. That's what David said right before this moment where he's like, search my heart. So it's almost like all of a sudden, David has this bipolar switch. Um, he has this like bipolar moment. Because all of a sudden, he's basically like, whoa, 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 whoa. I guess I've been guilty of some of those things. But what's interesting to me too is that he doesn't do the self-check himself. But he asks the Lord to search and know his heart. How many of you know that it's easy for us to see the sin of others, but harder to see our own? That is so right. Yes. You know, David recognized that. He recognized that. Have you ever noticed that? Like, you could be thinking about doing something that you know is way out in left field and you shouldn't be doing, and you think about it. You think about how you're going to do it. You, you know, you dwell on it, but then you don't do it. Okay? You're like, all right, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm not. I'm not going to do this. But then you see somebody. Who actually goes around, goes ahead, and does it? You act like you're, you like you feel outraged, right? Like how dare them do what I'm all about doing? Like, am I the only one that goes through that? No. Yes, maybe. Like, I feel, I feel like I'm there all the time because I'm like, how could they do something like that? You know, and, and it really, <laughs> it, it's just, it's just interesting to me because I, I wonder why I do that, and so I ask God. In the midst of that heart searching, like, why do I do that? Why do I do that? Why do I do that? And and the reason God revealed to me is because normally when I ask him to search my heart, I say search my heart, but I want him to show me what I want to see. Yeah. I don't say mm -hmm. search my heart and show me what you see. You see. Right. Yes. That's right. Because I'm not brave enough to do that often. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get there, but sometimes it's a struggle. Because when we look deep into our hearts, the scripture tells us that our hearts lie to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our heart is deceptive. Yeah. Our heart is, is, is wicked in nature. Our hearts tell us that deep down inside, we have a good heart, we're a good person, so things are fine yeah. the way that they are. Our heart likes to deceive us. But when we're brave enough to ask God to search our heart, we will quickly learn that God sees it completely differently. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is that Jesus, he is the only answer for dealing with that evil that's inside my heart. It's a daily battle. Scripture tells us that we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's a daily battle. We have principalities of darkness. It's, 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 it's a daily battle. And our heart didn't just, we weren't born wanting to do the right things. That's Otherwise, it would be easy. If it, if it was, you know, if we were born with this perfect condition, it would be easy for us to do the things that we know we should do. But as Paul says, we find ourselves doing the things we don't want to do. You know, it's because of our hearts. And, and even though, you know, we're in church 
lunch here, we are all just one conversation away from lying. If someone asks us, how are you doing today? Most of us say I'm fine. Because our heart wants to say you're fine. Now that could be because of the deception in the heart, but it also could be because of the fear. The very real fear that if we really are honest with people and tell people where we are struggling and where we need help in our lives, because the church in general has often let people down and has gossiped and has hurt and has, and has told yes. people's business and has shamed them, yes. that we can't find the healing that we need because yes. we're scared. Mm -hmm. We're scared of the people. Yes. So our hearts like to say we're fine. But what could happen if we step out in bravery and say, you know what, I'm not fine. I need some help with this. I've been struggling with this. This is what my heart is telling me. This is what I'm doing. And I don't want to do this anymore. This is what I'm doing. This is where I'm at. I need some resources. I need you to point me in the right direction. I need you to pray for me. What could happen to us if we did that? I'll tell you what could happen. Healing. Yes. Recovery. Amen. Freedom. Newness. Our deceitful hearts keep us from finding the love and the acceptance and the fellowship that's supposed to be in the body of Christ. So when you see the body of Christ not being loving, not being accepting, not being compassionate, not being real, not holding each other accountable, but being mean in spirit, when you see that, then you be the change that everyone else needs to see. Yes. You show everyone else what it looks like to be real with each other. How can we be the body of Christ if we don't know what each body part is doing? If your foot's sick, you, you fix your foot. You can't walk. If your tongue is messed up, you go to the doctor and they do some stuff in your tongue because you can't talk. We all need each other, but how can we function as a fully functioning body of Christ if we're sick and broken? Yes. We can't be at our best. Yes, we sure can. And that's because our heart wants us broken, defeated battered in a place of pain and sorrow because that's what the enemy wants but David said search me oh God and know my heart test me know my concerns see if there is any offensive way in me lead me in the everlasting way David asked the Lord See if there is any offensive thing in you. In other words, God, what in my life is offensive to you? Because easy for me, I found myself, I find it really easy for me to start making compromises with sin. Or even the appearance of sin. It's easy for me to do that. Here's an example. I've been told quite a few times that um, sometimes I can get short with people. Mm -hmm. Multiple people have told me that. I yeah. should, you can get in my mom's way, like, amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Multiple people have told me that, have called me out on that. Sometimes you can get short with people. My response is, I'm just blunt. Outspoken. Yeah, I'm just outspoken. <laughs> I just call it like it is. <laughs> but that's not loving. And that's not how Christ is. There's often times where, another example, like, I've heard like a friend of mine, you know, I told this friend, like, hey, you, you tend to be like really critical of people. And she just said, I just call it like it is. And then I responded with, well, yeah, that, that wasn't very loving. And then she's like, well, they had it coming. Because that's the culture we live in. They had it coming. And so the question is, where is Christ in that? So back to the heart. It takes a special kind of bravery to decide to love Jesus more than we love ourselves. Because when we find ourselves justifying the sin in our lives and our reactions and justifying our heart, really what we're saying is, I love myself more than I love Jesus. I love what I want more than I love Jesus. I love this feeling more than I love Jesus. That's what it boils down to. Because that's where I find myself. It's the battle of do I feel like I really love him or not? And it is a battle through the rest of our lives. It's not something that just magically goes away. But what it does is, 
is that when God begins to chip away at that, it becomes less of a struggle because then we find ourselves like, all right, I know I love Jesus, but Lord, I need you to help me with this. I need you to search my heart. And you keep doing it over and over and over. Let me give you a little bit of history about this Psalms 139, verses 23 through 24. So it's estimated to have been written about 1048 B.C. Now here's what was happening when it was written. It was estimated that David probably wrote this prayer after he was made king over all of Israel. Now the reason I told, I told you that is because that stood out to me. Because that seems like that would be a joyous occasion, right? He just made king. He was just made king over a whole nation, over God's chosen people. That should be a time of celebration. And yet that prayer is so heavy, right? Yeah. Search me, God. Search my heart. The prayer is heavy. And so that stood out to me, the contrast of it. But it gives me some comfort. Because this is what I realize. When we take inventory of our heart, when we say the prayer, we pray the prayer that David prayed, search my heart, God. Sometimes we find ourselves feeling and facing the betrayals and the hurts that others have done to us. Yeah. David had been wrong by the previous King Saul. He was betrayed by his own son for many years. He needed to cry out to the Lord, search me for what I've done. Lord, what could I have possibly done to have deserved the stuff that's happened to me? That's huge for people yeah. like me. It's huge when we pray this, when we pray this prayer, and then God does answer it by searching our heart. And He, because he, here's what happens: if you're like me and you and you've been hurt and you've had some situations happen, some things that you chose to to bury for your sanity instead of allowing Him to heal. Here's what happens when He reveals it. So for people who's been abused like me. When you pray that prayer and you're like, God, search my heart, here's what happens. He tells you, you didn't deserve that. You didn't deserve to be treated that way. You didn't deserve to be abused. You didn't deserve to be hurt the way that you did. You weren't at fault. Yes. Amen. Yes. Especially dealing with anything sexual abuse in nature. We need to hear God remind us that wasn't our fault. Amen. Yes. We yes. didn't do anything wrong. We didn't yes. deserve that. And he's not okay with that. Yes. He's not okay with what happened to us. So David needed God to search his heart for the bad, but also for the good. There's enough bad in the world. Sometimes we need God to remind us of the good that's in our heart. That's right. yeah. we, need to, we need to be reminded of that because that's where we're going to get our strength when things get difficult. And that's what recovery is all about. You heard me call it a healing ministry, or, or that's where we find healing. Because that's what recovery is. It's simply working towards healing. Amen. So we need God to search our hearts so that we can be good influences on the people around us. Every single person here has someone that they can influence or do influence. There's at least one person in your lives that you can step into their lives or already have and can be an influence. So the question is, are you going to do it the way that David did it? I got to influence these people. I got to lead these people. Lord, my heart's got to be in the right place. Mm -hmm. So that we can bring healing to others. Just like David did. So let's move on to the next Psalms. And that one is Psalms 32.5. 32.5. So I'm going to read that one to you again. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So I'm going to jump right into some history with this one. So Psalms 32 was estimated to have been written about 1034 B.C. Now here's what was going on during that time. David was already king. He had been king for a while. He was at war. He had this like loyal soldier named Uriah. Some of y'all may see where I'm going with this. Uriah was in his army. Uriah was loyal. He was noble. He was honest. He was a respectable soldier, a respectable leader. He was a good man. He was a good husband to his wife named Bathsheba. Yes. Now, while uh, Uriah was away at war, King David noticed Bathsheba. And he was overcome with lust for beauty, so he basically impregnated her. So, King David committed adultery. 
Yeah, just right to the point. We're going to get right to the point. <laughs> we're going to get right to the point. Now, Uriah, though, so here, but, you know, it's just crazy because, like, David didn't just leave it there. Like, oops, made a mistake. He didn't just, he didn't just leave it there. He just dug a deeper hole. So at that point, David wants to try to cover up the stuff he did. So he, he comes up with this plan. All right, he's like, that's she go, look, look, look. I'm going to call you right back from war. And I want you to go and be with him so then you can pretend that that's his baby. <laughs> that's more or less what he wanted to do. Yeah. So we did that. Uriah came back. But Uriah, being such a noble, honest man who truly loved his people, he was like, mm, I'm not here to sit here and be happy and joyful and be with my wife like this. When I got my, my fellow men, my, my brothers, they're, they're dying. On a war field? Yeah. I'm not about to be here and be with you like this. So he didn't play with her. Yeah. So, King David dug the ditch even deeper because David had some issues. <laughs> David had some issues. So then David's like, all right. So, have you guys heard of like a king seal? You guys know about the king seal? So basically what happens is a king, if he makes a decree or he sends out a letter, he puts a seal of some sort on it. Now, no one is allowed to break that seal except for the person who the letter is going to. If you did, <coughs> so it was a serious thing. So David made this letter, and in the letter, he wanted the general to put Uriah on the front lines. Mm -hmm. So he gave this letter, sealed it, gave it to Uriah, and said, take this to your general. Yep. Uriah was holding his own death orders. Yes. And he gave it to the general. The general opened it, put him on the front lines, Uriah was killed. Mm -hmm. And then David married Bathsheba. So now, David is not just an adulterer anymore, but he's a murderer. And it's like premeditated marriage. It's like they things are like out there. Like he really had some issues. And so God, like, he sent this prophet Nathan later. And he sends this prophet to call out David's sin because we're talking about accountability here, right? Yeah. Accountability. Because David was a murderer and adulterer, and yet he was supposed to leave these people. So he sent the prophet, you're right. I mean, he sent the prophet Nathan. And then we find ourselves in Psalms 32 5 again. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you will forgive the iniquity of my sin. David wrote that song around that time. He wrote that song after his encounter with the prophet Nathan, where Nathan told him everything that he did. He exposed his sin, and that was David's response. Now you can feel the regret, the acknowledgement of David's sin in that song. And if you guys look in your Bibles and you've seen that there was a header in Psalms 32 in general for the whole Psalm of 32, you'll see that it's often called the joy of forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. That seems a little ironic, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The joy of forgiveness is so heavy though. It's so dark. It's so painful. How are they going to call it the joy of forgiveness? So here's what I got, and then I'm going to close. There's a couple things to think about. Now, the entire 32 Psalms, the entire uh, book of the entire 32nd chapter, um, the most pivotal verse out of all of those is Psalms 32 5. Because in that short passage, David goes through the ringer. He confesses his sin, he acknowledged he was wrong, he allowed God to uncover it. He let it be known what he had done between him and God. He confessed it. He admitted his sin against God. But this is why it's called the joy of forgiveness. Because he was cleansed of it. Mm -hmm. It says in the last line, you forgave yes. the iniquity yes. of my sin. Yes. yes. That cleansing, that's the critical point. Mm -hmm. That's the recovery journey. Yes. That's the beginning of the recovery yes. journey. That's where the joy comes from. Like she said, it mentioned the sin is no longer held 
against him. Yes. But here's the thing, don't be confused. In order for that sin to not be held against you, I'm going to tell you like it is. You got to confess it. That's right. That's right. You got to confess it. You got to you got to do what they did. Like, look, I messed up. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Make it right. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's basically what they did. And then the joy of forgiveness happened. Yes. Confession is about opening the door yes. for God to do what he's going to do. It's to heal us from our trauma. Yes, God. It's not always just sin. Sometimes it's the trauma, too. You confess that, and then you have the joy of forgiveness. Now, that doesn't mean that you did something wrong, but that means that you're choosing to allow God to heal you. Yes. And ultimately, maybe 20, 30 years from now, you'll find, your place, find yourself in a place of forgiveness. Yes. Or maybe it'll happen later, where you'll be willing to forgive. There's no time limit on it, though. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even when it seems like you'll never be able to, but eventually, when you allow God to work and yes. to search your heart, yes. you'll find yourself in that place of forgiveness, too. Yes. Yes. And that's when you know God's healing He is yes. moving. And that's when you can be a light to those in darkness, and that's yes. when you can be like, look, I've been there. Yes. That's why my recovery is based off of those in recovery, those who, who are dealing with substances and alcohol, those yes. who are, are struggling with those drugs and the alcohol, because that's where I was. Yes. And I'm able to come out on the other side of that and be like, okay, I asked God to search me, he did, and he forgave me, and boom, here we are. <laughs> Amen. I would love to pray with you. Yes. Pray for you. Yes.